Hello, everybody. I remember times better than these. I remember the days when I'd come home from school after a productive day of being called slurs. I'd swoop my hair to the sides, turn on a Brian Starr's interview. I am gay. Uh -huh. and then write an incoherent poem where I cram as many band names that I can think of into my notes app on my light blue iPhone 5C. And by the way, yes, I did come up with those, okay? I know everyone really liked those when those were a thing, so you can send a thank you letter to my email. Ladies only. And no fat chicks. You know, I actually have one saved right here. Let me read it to you. As I pierced the veil, I was asking Alexandria to bring me the horizon while she was sleeping with sirens. It was a day to remember. And no matter how hard I try to escape the fate, I just can't stop falling in reverse. Escape the fate. Falling in reverse. I wonder who this video is about. Max Green- I'm just kidding. It's Ronnie Radke. Ronnie Radke is one of the most prominent lead singers of one of the most popular bands in the world, Falling in Reverse. Ronnie has a career spanning almost 20 years. And throughout those years, he's released countless iconic hits, such as Situations and Not Good Enough for Truth and Cliche by his old band, Escape the Fate, and releasing so many amazing songs with his current band, Falling in Reverse. The Drug in Me is You, I'm Not a Vampire, Good Girls, Bad Guys, Raised by Wolves, and that's just on their debut album. And even after over 10 years later of that album, Album coming out, Falling in Reverse is still crushing it. They've been pulling massive numbers on their last four singles, and in fact, they've been selling out arenas all across the country. And Ronnie Radke himself has been one of the most influential figures in the alternative music scene. But there's a stain on Ronnie Radke's career. Multiple stains, actually. Murder, sexual assault, domestic violence. He was even arrested for injuring his own fans. I once hated Ronnie Radke too. In fact, I was blocked by him on Instagram around 2013 for talking shit. I hated Ronnie Radke because it was cool to hate Ronnie Radke. But I didn't tell anybody that back then The Drug In Me Is You was one of my favorite albums. And I think a lot of people hate Ronnie because there's so many people repeating the same things over and over that it must be true. I mean, why look into it? Why do the hours and hours of research that I did for this video? Well, you don't have to because in this video, I'm going to be correcting the narrative on Ronnie Radke. I'm just glad that people care enough to hate me or care enough to love me because there's some bands out there that are super good, that, but no one cares. Ronnie recently released a book, uh, but I didn't have the chance to pick it up. It's currently sold out, and I don't know exactly what details he goes into, but I know he definitely has details that I don't have access to, so hopefully I'm not stepping on his toes too much by making this video. But hopefully this video will serve as an easy and accessible way to learn the true history of Ronnie Radke. This video is going to be in chronological order, but it's not going to be, you know, an entire documentary and retelling of Ronnie's entire life. But I do think it's appropriate to talk about, you know, his childhood and upbringing so we all understand where he came from and how he got to the point where he is now. And by the way, I should have said this in my Brian Stars video that I did a few months ago, but I may skim over some minor details for the sake of brevity, just so I don't load up a certain subject with more information than necessary. And I will pretty much guaranteed get something wrong in this video or mess up a small detail, but I've done a lot of work to make sure I'm not totally talking out of my ass on this one. So let's get into it. Ronnie Radke was born on December 15th, 1983 in Las Vegas, Nevada. Ronnie was mainly raised by his dad growing up. While both of his parents did have issues with drugs, his mother was almost entirely absent from his childhood. And this obviously created an extremely strained dynamic between the two for a very long time. Ronnie would begin to play the guitar and piano into his teens and develop an interest in music. He would experiment with a few bands in high school and eventually he would just drop out of high school and run away from home to go start a band with his friend Mitch. He would live with Mitch as well as Mitch's mom for a little while before moving back in with his dad and re-entering high school, only to drop out again. It's also worth mentioning that after Ronnie ran away from home, he began to abuse drugs. Oddly enough though, right before then, Ronnie's dad had just become sober and became a Christian. Anyways, when Ronnie was 17, he'd meet a young man named Max Green at a talent show. Ronnie and Max were in two different bands, but when Ronnie dropped his mic on stage, Max went to pick it up and give it to him. And after that, they had become friends. In fact, Ronnie and Max pretty much became brothers. They bonded over their absent parents, love of music, getting in trouble, doing drugs, and they shared the same birthday, only being a year apart. Ronnie and Max would even live together at one point. 
and a little while after they became friends, they formed a band called True Story, and later down the line in 2004, they would get together with a few other friends and create the band Escape the Fate, with Ronnie doing vocals and Max on the bass. Escape the Fate would put out a self-titled EP in 2005, and in 2006, they would sign with Epitaph Records after winning a radio contest hosted by none other than My Chemical Romance. And they would finally release an EP under Epitaph called No Sympathy for the Dead. This EP would be followed by the iconic album Dying is Your Latest Fashion, released on September 26th, 2006. Oh, I missed something important. On May 6th, 17 days before their EP was released, Ronnie Radke would travel to the desert, engage in a fight that would end in the death of 18-year-old Michael Cook. This event would not only change the course of Ronnie's entire life, but would linger over him and his reputation forever. And this is where we get into the claim that Ronnie himself is responsible for the death of Michael Cook. So when I say the phrase, Ronnie Radke went to prison on battery charges after an 18 year old was killed, it would be reasonable to assume that Ronnie actually killed the guy. But despite what some people on Twitter may say, context actually does matter, especially when you're talking about homicide. Anyways, I'm going to tell the story on Ronnie's non-existent murder charge for you, to the best of my abilities. On May 6th, 2006, Ronnie Radke and Max Green would get into some serious shit. And from what I understand, Max got himself in some trouble with two guys named Michael Colquitt and Marcel Colquitt, who are obviously brothers. They were threatening Max. It's hard to figure out exactly what was going on, but apparently it had something to do with one of the brothers' girlfriends. But they were pissed, and Ronnie eventually intervened on the behalf of Max. Ronnie wanted to stand up for him because Max was smaller, and he always viewed Max as a little brother. Anyways, these dudes were threatening Ronnie, and they even threatened to come to his house and, uh and they were pretty much egging him on to come fight them. Ronnie would eventually agree to fight them in the desert, so he traveled there along with Max, as well as Chase and Joe Raider, who once again are also brothers. So these four guys pulled up to find what Ronnie said was around 12 people there waiting for them. Pretty much, somebody pulled out a gun, Joe went to go grab the gun, his brother Chase pulled out his gun, shot, and killed Michael Cook, who was only 18 years old at the time. On top of Michael Cook being shot, Michael Colquitt was also shot, but he survived. But as you can tell from my entire recount of the story, Ronnie didn't really do anything other than be the mediator for Max. I'm not sure how much or how little he was involved in the scuffle that took place. I don't even know the details that well, uh, but he's certainly not a murderer. And just for clarity, let's run through all the charges of everyone involved. Chase Raider, who was the shooter and actual person who killed Mike, was arrested and charged with murder. But the charges were dropped because he got self-defense, it was self-defense. And Chase served no jail time. As far as Joe, who was Chase's brother, I don't think anything happened to him. There's no charges available. I think he was good. Michael Colquitt was charged with something that I can't find, but all the charges were dropped. And like I said, he survived his gunshot injury. Marcel Colquitt, who is Michael's brother, is an entirely different story. So from what I found, Michael is listed as a co-defendant to Ronnie, which pretty much means he was in the same place, during the same crime, and he got the same charges. But before Marcel could even be charged for anything, he unfortunately took his own life about a year after the incident. Michael Cook's mother believes that the reason that Marcel took his own life is because he felt guilty for what happened to her son. As for Max Green, Ronnie's best friend, despite being like the entire reason this whole thing happened, got away with no charges at all. And to make it worse, Max actually kind of turned his back on Ronnie. He even spoke to the victim's family and he had no interest in supporting Ronnie whatsoever. I should mention that Ronnie and Max have patched things up. It's been that way for a while. I mean, it's been like over 15 years since that shit happened. So that leaves good old Ronald. Ronnie was not arrested for battery. Ronnie was not arrested for assault and Ronnie was certainly not arrested for murder because he didn't actually do any of those things. He was arrested and charged with two felonies, possession of a dangerous weapon and the concealment of a dangerous weapon. Ronnie would take a plea deal to lower his two felonies to one, that felony being the battery charges that we're all very familiar of. Cause like I said at the beginning, like the idea that Ronnie Radke was charged with battery after an 18 year old kid was killed, it's reasonable to think that Ronnie was responsible, but he he wasn't responsible. He didn't murder him. He took a fucking plea deal and got five years of probation. I'm gonna just spell this out for everybody. You don't get five years of probation for killing somebody. At least I don't think you do. I've never killed anybody, so I don't know. But you may be asking probation, then why did he end up in prison? Well, he violated his probation, obviously. Uh, he wasn't good with meeting with his probation officer, and he also continued to use drugs, 
which was against the terms of his probation agreement. But he didn't kill anybody when violating probation. Anyways, he was sentenced to 18 to 48 months in a state prison for battery charges. Uh, he ended up serving two and a half and was released in late 2010. Anyways, I'm assuming that there's a few mouth breathers watching this video right now that I have to spell this out for again. If you think Ronnie Radke went to prison for two and a half years for murdering somebody, with all due respect, you are a retard, especially when there is no reputable source anywhere online that says that he murdered somebody. Unless you consider tabloids and 14 year old girls on Twitter reputable sources. Can you imagine having such a hate boner for somebody that you weaponize the death of an 18 year old that you don't even know to use against a person who had no involvement in their death? I mean, who's the real asshole here? It's not me. I know what's going on. Do you? No, you don't. Now you do, stupid. I think we can move past this one. There is no good reason to think that Ronnie Radke murdered somebody. This talking point is complete dog shit and the only people who are actually still talking about this are people that have absolutely no clue what they're saying. So obviously since Ronnie was going to prison for potentially the next four years, Escape the Fate had to move on and find a new singer, which was devastating to Ronnie. Obviously, I mean, that's rock bottom. You lose your band, you lose your friends. Not only are you going to jail, but you also have to detox off of drugs in jail. But Ronnie was not done making music just yet. With the help of a good friend named Nason, he was able to make connections with other people and begin to form a lineup while he was still in prison. Also, it goes without saying, by the way, but the entire time Ronnie was in prison, he was harboring a very deep disdain for the other members of Escape the Fate, especially their new lead singer, Craig Mabbitt. Also, I was looking at old pictures of Craig Mabbitt for this video, and I forgot how much of a cute, breedable twink he was back then. I'm sorry. But after two and a half years, Ronnie was released from prison on December 12th, 2010, and he immediately got to work on an album. An album, by the way, that is so good that even the most vitriolic Ronnie Radke haters can't help but love it. The Drug In Me Is You was released on July 26th, 2011, and Ronnie Radke would take the stage with his new band, Falling In Reverse, on August 10th, 2011 at Warp Tour. but they did play a few shows beforehand under the name Goodbye Graceful. So you know what? Honestly, everything worked out. Ronnie's clean, he's not doing drugs anymore. And besides, I'm pretty sure with Falling in Reverse, Ronnie is much more successful than he ever could have been in Escape the Fate. But it gets better. Craig Mabbitt leaving Bless the Fall made room for Bo Boken. Craig also formed the word alive before getting kicked out shortly after, so that's even more great music. And as far as Escape the Fate, uh. They kind of suck, so, you know, I mean, it's okay, you just ignore them. But at this time, the beef between Ronnie and Craig was still going strong. But not much happened. 2011 was a pretty good year for Ronnie. He was a free man, and Falling in Reverse was doing really, really well. 2012 would come with its obstacles, though. And Ronnie would face a few more scandals that would severely damage his reputation moving forward. Because on May 1st of 2012, Ronnie's at-the-time girlfriend, Sally, went to Glendale Police and reported that Ronnie had struck her. Ronnie was arrested in early August, and he was charged with a misdemeanor count of corporal injury and a misdemeanor count of false imprisonment. Misdemeanor false imprisonment is pretty much when you detain somebody within a certain area against their will and without the legal authority to do so. Corporal injury is essentially when somebody is injured as a result of assault and battery. That's not good. So Ronnie was arrested because he didn't show up to the court hearings. He was eventually bailed out on $30,000 and not much happened until 2014. In 2013 though, Sally actually did upload a picture of herself to her Twitter account, which I'm not going to show because she has a black eye, but it's obviously implied that Ronnie gave her the black eye and she used the hashtag set me free, which Ronnie would actually end up quoting in the song Bad Girls Club a few years later. But eventually in 2014, the trial was held. Sally tweeted out the following. For the record, domestic battery is now officially on Ronnie Radke's criminal record. Hashtag set me free. The plea bargain means no jail time will be served, but it doesn't mean he has been found not guilty. He has waived his rights to trial by jury. Two years ago today, I rented a moving truck and left my abuser. Today, he finally appeared in court to plead no contest to domestic violence. Ronnie claimed the exact opposite on Twitter, however, saying that the domestic violence charges were actually dropped, and it appears that Ronnie is telling the truth, they were dropped. So I'm not denying that there could have been a scene or a spectacle or something happened, uh, but clearly if the domestic violence charges were dropped, there's probably a pretty good reason for that. 
Ronnie did plead to a misdemeanor charge of disturbing the peace. Disturbing the peace is a very open-ended charge, but I think you can guess what it implies. It was a big old ruckus. Ronnie served no jail time, and this was all decided in a court of law. Now, I want to be very careful here. We are talking about domestic violence, and I don't want to make statements that I can't personally back up. At the end of the day, all we have to work with is Ronnie went to court for this and served no jail time for it. I don't feel comfortable like taking one side over the other because at the end of the day, it's not my business and I don't have the authority to advocate for one side over the other. But that's kind of my point, like neither do you. And you shouldn't weaponize this scenario because either A, you're weaponizing an assault that you genuinely think happened so you can win arguments over the internet, which makes you a piece of shit. Or B, you're weaponizing an assault that didn't even happen to win an argument, which also makes you a piece of shit, you know what I'm saying? This case is fucking close. I'm wearing a different sweatshirt right now. New Periphery merch, new album merch came in today. I'm excited about that. So we are less than 24 hours until this video that you're watching right now is dropping. And I realized that I left some stuff out that I need to add in. So I didn't make this video because I'm a Ronnie fanboy that wants to do everything in his power to protect him. In fact, just a few minutes before in the video, I made it very clear that I don't want to take sides on this. So keep that in mind while I add context and continue to not take sides. I made this video because it really upsets me how often false narratives about Ronnie are spread. And I make every video with the intent of being honest and having integrity. I'm not here to save Ronnie. I'm here to tell the truth. I am correcting the narrative. I'm not warping the narrative into something better. So I was informed that there is actually a court transcript posted by Sally herself, and I'm going to be going over the information um, but just to make it clear, I'm not super hip on the legal terms that are used, so excuse me if I fuck something up. So it's very likely that Ronnie's charges were dismissed because he took a plea deal. As you can see here from the court transcripts, Ronnie was guilty of a third charge for California Penal Code 415, which is the disturbing the peace charge. But this violation was added on the court date, May 14th, 2014. Ronnie was also sentenced to a summary probation, which is pretty much an informal probation for two years or 48 months. He didn't have to meet with a probation officer, but he still was required to, you know, follow the law and he had to stay away from Sally. Another small rhetorical issue is that the charges weren't dropped like Ronnie claims, they were actually dismissed. The difference between dismissed charges and dropped charges are pretty minimal. If a charge is dismissed or dropped, they both mean that the charges aren't going to be used to determine the verdict. But the thing is, is judges cannot drop charges. They can only dismiss them. The charges were filed and charges will only be dropped before they're filed and taken to court. The count of false imprisonment and the count of corporal injury were filed. They weren't dropped. From what I understand, charges are only dropped before they're sent to a judge and usually they're dropped due to a lack of evidence or a lack of witness cooperation, which means that potentially the allegations of corporal injury were substantial enough to be taken to court and perhaps the black eye that Sally had was actually real. And this goes into another issue, Sally as well as Ronnie's ex-fiance Chrissy and ex-girlfriend Jenna King have all alleged that Ronnie has physically assaulted them. I'm not here to tell you what to think. And honestly, aside from the murder charge we just talked about and another allegation that I'll be getting into, um, pretty much everything I talk about here is up for your interpretation. Once again, this video is about correcting the narrative. I'm not telling you what to think or how to feel about Ronnie. I'm just telling you what information is available online and you can do with that information what you will and come to your own conclusions. So I have no problem giving my opinions on anything on this channel. You'll see that as we progress throughout the video, um, but I don't like to speculate on the severity of things that I can't substantiate. Overall, this is just really hard to take a side on because you know, on one hand, the, these women, they dated Ronnie and they all kind of say the same thing. That doesn't look good. And Ronnie does have anger issues. It's very possible that maybe you know, Ronnie would snap occasionally and do something that normally he wouldn't do. At the same time, Ronnie has gone to court for some of these allegations and he has gone through the legal system and is a free man now. And it doesn't seem like there's any allegations of him recently abusing anyone. He's been in a relationship for like the last five years, haven't heard anything. So who knows? But at the end of the day, like if you don't like Ronnie for these allegations, like that's totally valid. And if you're worried he'll be violent in the future, that's valid too. But there's nothing we can really do because like I said, he's a free man. There doesn't seem to be any abuse in his current relationship, at least not that we can see. So if you don't like somebody, the best thing that you can do is not keep their name in circulation, especially Ronnie, who's 
career has thrived off of hatred and negativity and tabloids and all this shit. If anything is going to happen with Ronnie being abusive, whether it's the first time or it's the hundredth time, there's nothing we can do about it. So it's best to just ignore him if you actually have a problem with it. But I wanted to make all of this information apparent because like I said, I want this video to be as honest and open as possible. Anyways, back to the video. I'll be wearing my Veil of Maya sweatshirt instead of my periphery one. So I did have to flash forward to 2014 to conclude this part of the story. So now we have to flash back to 2012 where the infamous mic stand incident took place. So this one is a little different from the last two things we talked about because this one definitely happened, but I do have lots of things to say on this situation. On September 29th, 2012, Falling in Reverse would play at Six Flags for their <laughs> best evil. It was like the first ever metal festival that they did at Six Flags. And it would also be the last because Ronnie Radke at the end of the performance would proceed to throw three mic stands into the crowd where he injured a 24 year old man and a 16 year old girl. So this was clearly like a rock star moment, but uh, Ronnie could have easily killed somebody doing this. Like, thank God he didn't. In fact, the 16 year old girl was actually sent to the hospital due to a cut in her head and the guy had to get staples in his head. So Ronnie would end up being arrested for, Bruh. God damn it, assault. So Ronnie Radke would be arrested for this for simple assault and aggravated assault. Simple assault is an assault that results in minor injuries. Aggravated assault is assault that results in major injuries. The minor injuries being bruises, the major injuries being, you know, cuts on their head. And he would be released on $25,000 bail. And holy shit, Ronnie, you could have saved so much money. But he didn't go to jail for this. In fact, I'm pretty sure he paid for those people's hospital bills. Also, according to a TikTok that was posted by Ronnie himself, he says that the girl received $800,000. I don't know anything about the guy, but I know he was injured. I'm sure he got some kind of settlement as well. But the thing is, this girl is not mad and she's not the one bringing this up. Once again, you see this pattern of Ronnie Radke cock munchers that are consistently weaponizing trauma that they did not go through, they did not experience, and they don't have the full context on for the sake of winning internet points. And apparently Ronnie is the piece of shit in this situation. I don't think that's how it works, but okay. I mean, it was a dumb mistake. It was stupid. Thank God no one got killed. But this is something that Ronnie himself will admit was really fucking dumb and really dangerous, and he hasn't done it since. The people that were involved were compensated, and everyone's happy, except for the miserable losers on Twitter. This case is closed. So one last thing happened in 2012. Of course, I'm talking about the IC Stars incident. I'm just gonna keep it a buck with all you. I this drama is so irrelevant to me and anyone else who isn't a lobotomite um but i have to talk about it because people who can't even name a single member of ic stars bring it up all the time can i even name all the member the members of ic stars i love ic stars i should know devin andrew zach <laughs> brent jeff was i feel like there's a jeff and then there was a blonde guy well, i don't know what his name was fucking like richard or some shit anyways there was this issue between ronnie and icy stars when they were touring together this issue between ronnie and icy stars has been resolved for a while i think it was like done after like six months or a year ronnie says that icy stars wasn't being punctual and were super lazy Icy Stars says that Ronnie was a uh, big old dick, which to be honest, I believe both of them. I think both of those things could have happened at the same time. I mean, Icy Stars always struck me as a chill band that seemed laid back. I wouldn't be surprised if they were a little lazy. And Ronnie telling Zach that he doesn't like his stupid fucking face <laughs> seems realistic, I guess. I mean, out of all the members of IC Stars, it seems like Zach would be the one that, <laughs> that he would say that to. Anyways, kids who wanted to see IC Stars were not happy at all, and they were chanting IC Stars in between their songs, and you know, I understand that definitely pissed Ronnie off, and so he kicked those kids out, and I guess also Ronnie spit on somebody allegedly. Definitely not cool, you know, but at the same time, if murder allegations and domestic abuse allegations aren't enough to bury Ronnie's career. I certainly don't think the IC Stars drama is. I mean, the worst thing Ronnie did in this situation realistically was make a diss track called I Wash Cars, which later leaked online. My favorite part of this song, by the way, or maybe my least favorite, depending on how cynical you are, is the part where Ronnie says, you're a digital bunch of gays, which by the way, is a play on words of the album title, Digital Renegade. You know what, Ronnie? 
fuck you. I like that album. Moving on, Ronnie managed to stay out of trouble for a little while. In 2013, they released their sophomore album, Fashionably Late, with notable songs such as Alone. Now, Alone is pretty much the stick stickly of 2013. I'm sorry, is that too is that too far? I think that's probably too far. I mean, I like stick stickly. Like, I hated this song when it first came out, but now I love it. Also, around this time is when I was jumping on the hate Ronnie Radke for no reason bandwagon. So I went onto Ronnie's Instagram and I told him that Alone sucked balls and he blocked me. Ronnie, I'll be done roasting you after this, but I just have to read this one part. Man, I've been in rap since I was shitting in pampers. Climbed the ladder to the top and now I'm shitting on rappers. Also, I really love at the end of Alone, Ronnie goes, Yo, following in reverse, motherfucker 2013. <laughs> I'm losing my mind right now. I'm only halfway through the script. And around this time, Ronnie would start to rebuild some bridges. He rekindled his friendship with Max Green, who, like I said, you know, they had some serious problems. In October 28th of 2013, the Bury the Hatchet tour was announced. This tour would feature falling in reverse and none other than escape the fate and ronnie and craig did an interview together and the beef was squashed and when the bury the hatchet tour was announced it was also announced that max had rejoined escape the fate after leaving in 2012. however max would leave escape the fate about seven months later and join falling in reverse where he stayed for five months and then left again but the splits were amicable what we're seeing here is ronnie is letting go of his grudges he isn't mad at craig for stealing his spot he isn't mad at max for turning his back on him ronnie is growing he isn't that 22 year old kid who's addicted to drugs and getting into fights in fact in 2014 it seems like he patched things up with his mom a little bit after he posted a picture of him and her together and 2014 was a year of writing touring and not getting arrested 2014 was an amazing year for ronnie radke's standards and a normal year for every other lead singer who goes on warp tour unless their name is johnny craig <laughs> i shouldn't say that he's a changed man following year 2015 would see the release of falling in reverse's third album just like you however we would see another devastating allegation an allegation that despite being over as soon as it started is still something people run with to this day because after a performance on june 3rd 2015 a 25 year old woman named casey alleged that ronnie radke as well as his bodyguard sexually assaulted her in their tour bus as well as a second time in a car Casey claimed that she had significant injuries after the assault. She also claimed, like I said, to have been assaulted two separate times. Once in the tour bus during the performance by Ronnie's bodyguard, and the second time in a car with Ronnie's bodyguard as well as Ronnie himself. And this was all announced like a week after it all happened, and Ronnie's team issued this statement. Radke has been exonerated as fully as can occur in less than one week. The police swabbed the tour bus and the car and found no evidence of rape. The police have taken no action against Radke. The police did not arrest Radke. To add further context, it says, One of Boswell's Facebook comments stated Radke and his accomplices posted bail, but information provided to AP by the Murray City Police Department appeared to contradict this. So the first assault was impossible because Ronnie's bodyguard obviously wasn't away from the show in the tour bus during the performance. He is his bodyguard. He was near the stage where Ronnie is. So that already kind of shows that she's lying and the other one probably isn't true, but the second assault couldn't have happened either because while Ronnie and the bodyguard were in a car with her, Ronnie was in the front seat, which contradicts how she told the story. On top of that, they fully complied with the police with a search and a swab of both the bus and the car, and there was no evidence of any assault. And this all happened in a very, very small window of time. So they were all in a car together uh, because they were going to a bar and Casey was hammered beyond belief. And Ronnie said, you know, fuck this. Either she's going to a hospital or she's going home. So she gave them a location to drop her off, which for some reason was the side of the road. And she called the police on them. And eyewitness accounts confirmed that she was like super drunk, visibly drunk. Ronnie and his bodyguard were never arrested for this. They willingly went to the police station. They answered questions and they left. No charges, no bail, no trial. And by the way, Ronnie filed a defamation lawsuit because of this and he won. So once again, much like the domestic violence allegations or the murder allegations, if you use this story against Ronnie, whether it's true or not, you are a shitty person because you're either using fake allegations to bolster your argument or you're weaponizing real trauma that once again, you didn't experience for internet brownie points to fucking shit on a celebrity who doesn't even know who you are. It's really unfortunate that I have to do research for these grown adults who are terminally online arguing about shit that they know nothing about and it's ironic because they act like they care but if they really cared they'd probably look into 
any of this public information that is available to literally anybody. At this point, some of you probably think I'm a Ronnie Dick Rider. To that, I'd say you should probably look in the mirror. And I'd also implore you to do the 20 fucking hours of research that I did before commenting stupid shit like that. Anyways, now we've gotten pretty much everything out of the way, but there's still a few things that we need to talk about. So I'm not going to be going over the timeline of falling in reverse anymore. Obviously, they've done really well and there's notable things that have happened, but we're here to talk about, you know, the narrative on Ronnie Radke and what I'm going to be talking about next doesn't really have a timeline that I can like, you know, I can figure out where it goes. It's kind of just a lingering issue. And all of this stuff is kind of the main reason I was inspired to make this video because recently Ronnie has been going full Twitter fingers and I'm here for it. I have always been of the belief that if you shit talk somebody with a ton of followers and directly tag them, you shouldn't expect good things to happen. I mean, maybe nothing will happen, but good things certainly won't. And with the recent addition of TikTok to the lineup of time-wasting social media apps, people have been shit talking Ronnie like crazy. And Ronnie has been giving some hot takes which have led people to believe that he is a bigot. So I'm going to be focusing on Ronnie's alleged racism and transphobia because I believe those are the most prominent characterizations of Ronnie in recent times. But he's been called everything, homophobic, sexist, blah, 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 blah. So I was really struggling to figure out how I should, you know, articulate myself in this part of the video. I faced a few roadblocks. Um, number one, unlike the previous claims, there's not really any empirical evidence that I can appeal to. There's no eyewitness accounts or court documents or successful defamation suits. And ultimately, I can't prove or disprove whether or not Ronnie is or isn't transphobic and racist because ultimately your definition of racism and transphobia may be different than my definition or Ronnie's definition. And on top of that, I don't know what's in Ronnie's head. He very well could be those things and I don't know. And while I do have a lot to say on these subjects, that's where I came into my second problem. I was typing pages and pages trying to explain my thoughts on this issue before I realized that I was just making this video a political thesis, which takes away from the point, which is to correct the narrative on Ronnie Radke. And no matter how much I write or how digestible I make my talking points, uh, even if I wrote the perfect argument that was brief and it was articulated well, I can't change a lot of people's minds on this issue in the time frame that I have. Because like I said, your definitions and my definitions may be different and I can't really change that. But if you guys do want me to go more in depth, maybe I can make a follow-up video where I just dedicate it solely to fleshing out these ideas more. People call Ronnie a racist because he has voiced his problems with the media's presentation of white people being shooters and pointed out that people of all races commit shootings. This is true. POC people take up a lot of mass shooting statistics. And the media, both in the news and on social media, do definitely focus on white people in these instances. But the reality is, is that there's more nuance. Black people commit higher rates of gun crimes because on average, black people are more impoverished. And impoverished people are more likely to commit crimes. And just to add a bit of context to this, being impoverished doesn't necessarily mean that you are more likely to be violent or commit a violent crime. But the percentage is much higher for impoverished people because people who are wealthy have more incentive to not engage in those violent crimes. And the solution to the issue of black gun crimes is already inherent, which is correcting the damage done to black America. Because we know that black crime rates are high because of the damage done from systemic racism. And by the way, I just wanna make this clear. Obviously there's no laws that hold black people back in America, but you need to realize that systems are more than just government and laws. Systems are people, environments, and institutions, and the people who occupy those environments and institutions. It's a very nuanced discussion that I don't have time to flesh out here. But the point I'm trying to make is that Ronnie is correct and he's making a good point but my problem with what he's saying isn't the fact that he's racist it's the fact that there's much more to this than the media picking on white people and i think that's what we should be telling him rather than just calling him racist nobody's gonna fucking listen to you if you call them racist there's tons of klansmen and nazis that won't even admit they're racist why the fuck would ronnie do it another thing is ronnie has also voiced his problems with modern pro-trans rhetoric he specifically pointed out the fact that there's only two genders it also seems like he's very skeptical about non-binary identities which by the way most people do believe there are only two genders non-binary is not a gender it's an absence of gender and i don't accept neo pronouns as genders most people don't and i certainly don't accept the fact that we need hundreds of different terms just to call ourselves non-binary and i understand not understanding non-binary identities i mean there's a lot less research 
than there is for trans identities. And even the concept of not having a gender identity is a new concept to a lot of us, but it seems reasonable enough for me to support it and be fine with it. But once again, there's an aspect that Ronnie doesn't see when he says these things. Because even I, when I see someone say, there are only two genders, I assume that person is transphobic. And it's not because I disagree, it's because the term is typically used as a transphobic dog whistle. But I wanna make it clear that not everyone who says this is transphobic. Like I said, I do agree with the sentiment. There are two genders, man and woman. You can be non-binary, you can't be a fucking frog, you can't be a deer, you can't be a uh, like an autistic gender, I don't even know what that is. We associate the term there are only two genders with transphobia because usually transphobes are saying it to trigger the libs. The thing is, our standards for what transphobia is, is fucked. And I think it's because people on the left are not advocating for trans issues in a way that makes other people who don't understand want to agree with us. I genuinely believe that most people who are transphobic aren't actually transphobic, they've just never heard a convincing argument from somebody who's willing to actually have a conversation in good faith. So I used to be transphobic actually, like pretty recently, and not that I was like, I hated them, but I just thought it was, you know, delusion. I thought they were crazy. It was just a phase and they were doing it for attention. But I actually watched a debate between the streamer Destiny and the YouTuber Mr. Beard, where Destiny made really convincing and reasonable arguments that didn't fall in line with the batshit lefties you see on Twitter. And he crushed Mr. Beard, who was essentially the definition of that woke SJW leftist libtard. I genuinely encourage all of you to watch that debate. It's fantastic. I'll leave a link in the description. The video is over an hour Long, but the debate lasts about 50 minutes. I can go on and on about these issues. Like I said, if I need to make a follow-up video and it's necessary, I will. But anyways, to wrap this problem up, Ronnie hasn't said that he doesn't like trans people or that he doesn't like black people or POCs. Ronnie is always critiquing the narratives, not the people. The narrative on anti-black racism and the narrative on pro-trans movements are flawed. If they were perfect, they, we wouldn't need them. Not to mention, I've seen Ronnie with tons of black people and has shown love to tons of black artists. And according to my friend Shane, who's the guitarist of the band Since Masada, uh, he told me that recently a few of his friends who are all LGBT went to a Falling in Reverse concert recently, and apparently there were tons of queer and POC people there. So take that for what you will. So in conclusion, even if you take everything I say in good faith, even if I make a follow-up video to this that's like nuanced and goes into these topics a lot more, and you still believe Ronnie is racist and transphobic, I already accepted a long time ago that there is nothing I can do. So let me remind you with this one fact. You can't cancel ideas. You can't cancel racism, sexism, homophobia, or transphobia. You can only cancel people. And I don't think Ronnie is one of those people you can. The reality is when a lot of people are addressing these bigotries, they just appeal to ad hominem attacks on his character based on the lies that I've already talked about in this video. And that's really frustrating as people on the left, we should be trying to advance trans issues and POC issues. And part of that is having difficult conversations in good faith, which it seems like a lot of people on Twitter aren't interested in doing. They just want to play hero. I personally believe Ronnie is not a bigot. Yes, he has said some stupid shit. He said shit that I don't agree with. And yes, he slipped up with misgendering. Maybe he said a few slurs 10 years ago, but people change, cultural norms change, I changed. And you're never gonna convince anyone to change their mind when you're being a fucking dick to them, even if they're being a dick to you. Until further notice, this case is closed. And I'm gonna sum this all up with the claim that Ronnie Radke is an asshole. Ronnie is definitely an asshole. Anyways, peace out gamers.